Hi there, this is Colin McGarry with Walking D-Day. Today we're walking WN62 on Omaha Beach. We'll be talking about the Beast of Omaha, Robert Kappa's missing photos, the famous let's get the hell out of here speech, and the first incursions off the beach. If you appreciate these videos, you can help the channel by clicking a like, clicking subscribe, plus the bell, making comments, asking questions, or even on Patreon or PayPal. So let's go. The Omar sector spreads 11 miles from this side of Pont Bessin, where you can see the jetty, and in the other way to Grand Camp, which is just at the base of the Shribble Peninsula. Omar Beach itself spreads four miles from Kabul, which is just the other side of that valley. You can see the end of the beach there. And that way, it goes up to Verville. Along that stretch, there are 14 strong points of Widerstandness, or WN, numbered from 60, which is over there, 61, which is down the valley, to 62, and it goes up to 73 at the far end. Now, fortunately, three of them are inland, WN63, WN67, 69. That left 11 on the beach. By contrast, the troops on Utah Beach were supposed to go into two strong points. They went astray and they went into one strong point on a two mile front. WN62 was the largest strong point along the beach. It stretched from just by the beach right up to past here, 130 foot high on top of the bluffs. It had two casemates facing westwards that could house 75 millimeter guns. In total, there were two R669 casemates, one R667 casemate under construction, a machine gun tow brook, four mortar tow brooks, two escape bunkers, that means special construction, one observation post, two 75mm guns, and one 75mm anti-tank gun, automatic flamethrowers, and a Zeiss photophone, or a light walkie-talkie. Rommel was racing against time to improve the defences along the Atlantic Wall. Here they just built two casemates to house 75mm guns, which had been on open platforms. The site was manned by 40 men, 27 of the 716th Division and 13 from the 352nd Division, which had just recently moved into the area. The 352nd men were manning a gun battery inland at Hoodville. Everybody knows of Breakout Manor, which was taken by the Banner Brothers. That was a gun battery behind Utah Beach, inland about three miles. And that was one of a whole line of gun batteries behind Utah Beach. And the same thing along here, there was a line of gun batteries inland which could fire onto the beach. And Hoodville was one of them. Now here they had an observer post and they'd send back coordinates to the guns to fire on. The commander of the strong point was Lieutenant Edmonds. He was based in WN63, that was his command post, which is along the road leading up to Colville sur Mer. WN62 is one of the best preserved strong points along the coast. This one has two underground bunkers for the troop shelters. There are two rooms in this underground shelter. This one has walls built up on the side. There was a window here because it's underground and then a corrugated iron roof. And the other one is parallel to this. Now this one is completely uh, circular or semicircular, with corrugated iron, the same depth. 
And here there's a escape hatch that goes up to ground level. You crawl in there and there'd be a ladder to go up. This is where the escape hatch comes up. Then turning right at the end, there was a trench that led to another a tow brook. There's the entrance to a mortar tow brook. I'm not going to crawl in there. And then this way, and this was the little emplacement for the photophone. Because it's half filled up. So there's an opening there. And this is a photophone bunker or emplacement. It was to send messages to the command post WN63. Well, that's in the valley down there. They couldn't have a direct sight to that. But the church is visible and that probably was used to receive the messages. From WN62, across the valley you can see WN61 and on top of the bluffs, the other side, WN60. Two of the German veterans that survived Omar Beach were here. One was called Franz Gockel and the other one Heinz Severlo. They both wrote books about their experiences during the war. Heinz Severlo occupied the room in this farmhouse at Hoodville. Major Plaskat was their battalion commander. He was billeted at the Chateau of Etram near Molle. On the 2nd of June, he made a strange speech to the men at the battery. He said, when the invasion started, they should break off the combat as soon as possible. They didn't understand why he said that. It perhaps explained why he couldn't be found on D-Day, despite what he told Cornelius Ryan as being in the observation post as portrayed in The Longest Day. Lieutenant Frerkin was the commander of the battery. His orderly was Hein Severlo. And they set off from Hoodville on the morning of the 6th, just after midnight, to come to the observation post, which was manned 24 hours a day. They arrived here just before one o'clock in the morning. Lieutenant Ferrokin was in the observation post and Severlo was in a machine gun pit just below it. At 1.30 in the morning of the 6th, the men in Gockel's bunker were woken up and called to action stations. There had been so many false alarms in the previous weeks. Many of the men just turned over, tried to go to sleep again. And then the NCO came in the door. He said, no, this is the real thing. So they all jumped up and ran to their action stations. Everything was quiet. They began to think this was just another false alarm. They heard the sound of massive bombers and then the sound faded. Then he saw some vessels on the horizon. Perhaps they were German patrol boats. And then there were more and more. The Germans called the Allied fleet the Black Ribbon. A thousand ships and 5,000 other craft. Bombers were heard approaching. Now the bombing on Omar Beach was fouled up, as most people know. The bombers were told to hesitate a few seconds so as not to bomb the landing craft because with the cloud cover they couldn't see their target and they bombed the mile inland. But some bombs did fall on the defence positions. Gockel mentions two bombs falling and getting showered with debris. But then the naval bombardment started. Now the ships are firing at this and you can't make out any bunkers but the effect on the German soldiers was terrifying. 150 warships firing, plus landing craft with rocket launchers in. Now the landing craft were approaching. An NCO told the men not to fire too soon. So as the landing craft approached, everything was quiet. Now the GIs had been told that the bombing had annihilated the German resistance, or they'd be pretty groggy. And as everything was quiet, they thought that what they'd been told was true. But it's when the first landing craft hit the beach, all hell let loose. Now if you've seen the Saving Private Ryan, 
the first 15 minutes of that give a good impression of what it was like on Omar Beach in the first wave. Anti-tank guns and mortars from 11 strong points, plus 85 machine guns opened up, plus all the men with rifles. We had plus 400 German defenders along the beach, in the strong points and on tren in trenches along the top of the cliffs. On this eastern end of the beach, the first division was landing, the big red one. On the other end of the beach, the 29th division was landing. Ray Lombert was a medic who landed just below WN62. He saw a wounded man caught in barbed wire attached to the Czech hedgehogs. They had to go under the water to free the man. Then the landing craft coming in dropped its ramp on his back. He would have drowned. But fortunately, the coxswain deciding that the landing craft should change position and the ramp went up again. In great pain, Ray pulled the man up the beach. There was no shelter on the beach, except this rock. Ray used it to shelter wounded men. When he was finally taken off the beach to hospital ship, he ended up next to his brother. The concrete block had supported a crushing machine to make gravel from the shingle. It was on this part of the beach where the famous words spoken by Robert Mitchum as General Cota in The Longest Day were actually pronounced. It was Colonel Taylor who said to any man he met as he strolled along the beach that there were two types of men on the beach, those that are dead and those that are going to die. So let's get the hell out of here. It was also near here that the first incursion inland started. The landing started at 6.30. It wasn't until 8.30 that Lieutenant Spaulding and his men made their way up the shallow valley that leads to the, where the cemetery is now. Then they turned right to attack their objective, WN64. Robert Capper, war correspondent, came in here. He had two contact 35mm steel cameras and took photos for some time before getting back on the Samuel Chase to get them to London. These photos have become iconic of D-Day. Only eight were published. The myth of what happened to the others will be another video. WN60 at the far eastern end of the beach was taken around 9am after Jimmy Monteith led tanks through minefields allowing them to get off the beach and up a lane that went around the back of the strong point. That's what it's taken throughout the day. WN65, which is the next valley, that got a shell through it, through the opening, directly knocking out the gun. And that was probably from the USS Doyle. In the lower casemate, Corporal Brinkmeyer and Private Learman were probably here with machine gun and rifles. You can't see very well out now, there was a brush growing up. But that was all cleared away at the time. The marks on the wall were made by placing rope inside the form before pouring the concrete. These niches were to store shells. These square and oblong holes were to fit a door to close off the gun opening. They were never put in place because they weren't really finished. This sloping wall is to protect the gun from fire from the ships. That meant if there was a gun in here, it could only fire along the beach or into the sea near the beach. This wall has a gouge mark in it probably from a Sherman on the beach. Now the gun would normally be brought in the back door, but these chicane protection walls would have stopped it coming in that way. You have to come in the front. From here they can fly the whole way down the beach. Corporals Lehrman 
Kreeftwerp, Selbach and Drews were the crewmen of the gun here. Camouflage markings made by ropes and there's some damage has been done by shots coming through. Now just at the top of the steepest slope was this observation post was placed. This is where Lieutenant Ferking was giving orders back to the guns at Hoodville. This is the entrance to it. You get a good view down to the beach. Corporal Warneck and Private Schultz are on the radio link connected to Hoodville. Ay, 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 ay. Oh. Ein Sevelo was just below the position with his machine gun. The 352nd Division had only recently moved up from near Saint Lo. They hadn't had time to move all their supplies. Their guns at Hoodville ran out of ammunition in the afternoon. A truck bringing up more ammunition on D-Day was hit by a 15-inch shell from a ship. Just here is a gun platform for the 75mm guns, one of which had been moved into the casemates. You see trenches connected all the bunkers and emplacements. That would have carried on up there. Some yards above the observation post was Oberschutz Plotter in a 50mm mortar Tobruk. He could use a signal lamp to send messages to WN61 and WN60, just over there. The guardroom bunker was projected to be here, it's as far as it got. Ammunition niches were placed along the trenches. Franz Gockel was manning a Polish water-cooled machine gun. He also had some switches to operate the flamethrowers, which were down there the perimeter. Another ammunition niche placed along a trench. Hein Sevelo became known as the Beast of Omar Beach. He's supposed to have killed the most American soldiers on D-Day, but the figures cited don't make sense. There were 4,000 casualties on D-Day on Omar Beach, the worst beach, and out of that about 1,000 killed, and the numbers keep going up over the years. Now one machine gun can cover an eighth of the four miles of Omar Beach, and most casualties on D-Day, as in the Battle of Normandy, were caused by artillery. But anyway, Heinz Sevelo was manning the last machine gun working on D-Day. This was the last strong point to fall and he was the last man here still firing a machine gun. In the afternoon, Sevelo was running low on ammunition. He'd fired thousands of rounds from his machine gun. A sergeant he didn't know had been supplying with ammunition throughout the day. And now he was forced to use tracer bullets. Now not every bullet is a tracer bullet, one in five is. The position was already being shelled by ships and tanks and going up the trench, which runs perpendicular to the beach, didn't protect the men. Franz Gockel was badly wounded in the hand. Now Hein Sevelo, using tracer bullets, his position became visible to the ships now and shells were falling nearer and nearer to him. His gun was knocked out of his hand. And then around half past three, Lieutenant Freerking, he told 
Severo and another man to go inland while they could. The, the Americans were already working their way into the strong point through the Permita. So they left and a few minutes later a shell went through the opening of the observation post and killed Lieutenant Ferking. Lieutenant Ferking is buried in Block 7 in La Combe Cemetery along with 21,000 others. Hein and the other man went along the road that leads past the cemetery. Then they cut across country towards WN63, which is in that valley. Because he was wounded, he was allowed to lie on the ground near the strong point. As night fell, the officer told him and another man to take some American prisoners inland. They got up to the village, which was just a few hundred yards away. Then they realised they were surrounded. So they surrendered to their prisoners. Franz Gockel had been badly wounded in the hand while he was still manning the machine gun. The man with him, he said, oh, that's a ticket to go home. But Gockel was still in the army when he was taken prisoner by the Americans. Severo was sent to America as a prisoner and then he was sent back to the UK to work as a prisoner. In 1947, his father wrote a letter to the British authorities asking for his son to be sent home because he needed him on the farm. So Severo went home in 1947. In 2018, this rock was chosen to be the support of a memorial to the medics on Omar Beach. Charles Shea was one of the veteran medics who was present. Charles Shea actually lives in Normandy now. He was in action further up the beach. One of his comrades, medics, was badly wounded. All Shea could do was give him morphine before he died. Shea often visits the grave of Morozovich in the Normandy Cemetery. There are dozens of memorials along the D-Day zone. There are three just here. On top of this first casemate is a memorial to the 5th Special Engineer Brigade. As the names of the men who died On the sidewall of the casemate, there used to be a plaque commemorating Canadian wine speakers that cleared the channels on the approach to Omaha. It was in bad condition and the town took it down. There were 10 wine speakers in the Fretilla here, another six were off the British beaches. Binnacle Monument is to the 1st Division. It's got the names of 627 men who were killed on D-Day. The names picked out in gold are Medal of Honour winners and where it mentions NMI, that means no middle initial. Franz Gockel came to visit France in 1958 to see some families he knew from his time here and then he was involved in French-German reconciliation. He's also sponsored one of the trees leading up to the German cemetery at Lacombe. Now just after it was published, Severo read The Longest Day, and in there there was a story about a soldier called David Silva, who'd been wounded on Omar Beach. And in view of the time and the place he was when he was wounded, Severo realized it must have been he that wounded him. Now Silva, he'd uh, left the army after the war, become a priest and then he'd rejoin the army as a chaplain and he was actually in Karlsruhe in Germany. Now Severo sent some letters to addresses in the US to Silva, tried to contact him 
And then when he actually found out he was in Germany, he went to the camp uh, without being announced and he went to see Silva. They met again in 2005 in Normandy.